like a fucking elephant. We've got no hidden chocolate anywhere. Anyway. Welcome to the Cambridge Festival and this live discussion on following the science. I'm Rob Doubleday. I'm executive director of the university's Centre for Science and Policy and also a researcher on the Expertise Under Pressure project. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this session and also our four guests. Following the science, we heard from the Prime Minister at the beginning of the pandemic that the government was following the science. And we heard political leaders around the world say the same thing. During the past year, we've had a great lesson in how important it is that governments are informed by science, but also how complicated and, and complicated it is for that relationship between science and politics and policy to work effectively. Oh dear, so that's what we're going to explore stumbling. today. And we're joined by four really fantastic guests who are going to each speak briefly about their perspective on this question. And then we're going to open up to questions from, from you, the audience. Ooh. You'll see there's a link to Slido. That's so. the platform uh, for you to put your questions to us. That there's a code which you need which is 26671, as you see there, and a QR code. So do go to Slido, put your questions as, as we go through this discussion, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So we're joined by Daniela Bianchi, a professor of statistical science for health at the University of Cambridge and deputy director of the Medical Research Council's Biostatistics Unit. And Daniela has also been a member of SPIM, which is the government's advisory group on modeling pandemics which feeds into sage and we'll hear from daniela about her experience path patel who's an a and &E doctor a research fellow at the think tank ippr and also a researcher at ucl in their institute for health informatics and then we'll hear from claire craig who is provost of queen's college oxford and has had a career in government as a civil servant um, and during that time has worked for three government chief scientific advisors, latterly leading the government office for science and has also been uh, running the science policy uh, part of the Royal Society. And finally, behavioural scientist David Halpin, who is chief executive of the Behavioural Insights team and was the founding chief executive and has been leading it since 2010. David's also been chief analyst for the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit and held various roles at the intersection between policy and, and science and evidence. So we've got four great guests to introduce this conversation and then to engage in discussion. So we'll start, Daniela, with you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I hope this is going to be an interesting discussion. Okay, so um, as uh, Robert said, I'm a professor of statistical science in Cambridge and one of my or oh, oh, the big component of my research is uh, its own methodologies for real-time tracking of, uh, of emerging epidemics. And obviously this is quite, quite crucial in this, in, in this context. Uh, my work on this, uh, in, in, in this area started in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic. And since then, since 2009, I've been a member of the Scientific Pandemic Influential Group for Modeling, the SPIM that Robert uh, mentioned. And, uh, and th this, is a, this is a group that we, uh, was put together then to uh, support the government strategy from pandemic preparedness into input into the, the decision of uh, SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergency. Um, now, uh, this group, SPIM, is made up of a, a number of members from different institutions, typically academic institutions, and, uh, and uh, it, it was set up to deal with the uh, event of an emerging influenza pandemic. Of course, uh, in, in, at the beginning of 2020, it needed to, to change very rapidly. But the, the, the membership was re retained and enriched by other additional members coming from a, a range of um, institutions, including Imperial College, the London School, uh, um, Cambridge, Warwick, Bristol, Exeter, Lancaster. And, uh, and you know, it's contributing and it's still contributing to create the evidence for policy decisions 
and has been doing this throughout the pandemic and providing assessment to uh, the regular assessment of the current state of the pandemic, short-term project, projection of its evolution and uh, in the likely burden in terms of banks and hospitalization and how the various possible interventions might have uh, uh, worked or impacted uh, on the burden of the uh, pandemic. Of course, there were different stages of the pandemic. There was an initial stage uh, between January and March 2020, where uh, what was needed was an initial assessment of the likelihood of community transmission, an initial assessment of the likely evolution, including the, the magnitude and the peak of a potential pandemic, and, uh, and the impact or perhaps social restriction on this magnitude and uh, the evolution and the os possible hospitalization and deaths re uh, resulting from the pandemic. Then, of course, there was a second stage, which was a mitigation uh, phase, uh, where once it was realized that the, the pandemic was going to happen, then what would be the impact of various intervention to, as we said, then flatten the curve in such a way the NHS would, uh, would not be overwhelmed. And, uh, and so there was a number of, uh, there were a number of um, possible intervention be uh, considered, closing school, isolating symptomatic individuals, banning big gatherings and so on and so forth. And the group advised or provided evidence to the government to make decisions. Now, of course, there was the, the lockdown decision. And after the lockdown decision, the questions again changed. And, and there was uh, the questions are more like, um, um, how is the uh, pandemic progressing? When will we be able to reopen society? Or what will be uh, the situation where we would like to again uh, impose for, uh, social restriction. So all, all of this work, addressing all these questions in the different phases of, of the epidemic, providing the um, basic evidence that the government needed. And I, I really would want to, to, to underline, provide the evidence and not suggesting or making decision. And in fact, I remember very clearly that uh, our duty was that of providing evidence and not considering other, making other consideration for other components like costs. Uh, so it was uh, it was just on the basis of health that we had to make in, 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 provide evidence. Of course, uh, my my contribution in all of this, I was uh, uh, leading, or oh, I am still leading because it is all ongoing at the moment. A, a team uh, uh, in collaboration with Public Health England, and uh, we contributed like other groups to the initial understanding of, of the uh, potential of the pandemic, the initial understanding of the likelihood of, uh, of community transmission, and then again uh, to the regular assessment of the epidemic, of the pandemic, of in terms of you know uh, providing regular estimates of the famous R numbers. Uh, estimates of the growth rate of the of the, inf the infections, uh, understanding uh, how many people were um, were at the moment uh, at any moment in time uh, positive. Um, so and and then making prediction of the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of uh, beds that will be occupied. Uh, of course, all of this by different regions, by different groups, highlighting very much in the early stages the uh, heterogeneity, spatial heterogeneity that there was in the country, typically, which is still there, where, uh, sort of dividing the north and the south, for instance. So uh, how did, did this pro uh, process work? So we would, uh, we would meet with SPIM um, initially three times a week, and all the results on all the various aspects that we, we had been asked to look at uh, were discussed uh, at every session. And, um, and then the, a consensus view uh, uh, was typically reached and communicated to SAGE for decision making. So the 
there was a definitely uh, input from the science to the uh, to the decision making process. And the mantra was that you know throughout the pandemic the decisions were based on science. Okay, there were there are two basic, I wouldn't call them exceptions, but I would imagine you know situations where I did feel that uh, the science was not uh, really immediately taken to decisions. And uh, the two examples are the decision, the, the early parts of the of the pandemic, which led to the uh, to the lockdown. Uh, at that point, data and information was accumulating. We were really working hard to, to make sense of the. Uh, of the really limited information. Uh, I'm talking about February uh, 2020. And uh, it took a long time to the government to, to absorb or to seriously consider the type of information that we were providing. The second example is um, in September, where the signs after the, the, the uh, summer break uh, clearly indicating that um, there was a resurgence in the number of infections. And uh, around about the third week in September, uh, it, was, uh, it was clear that something needed to be done. And we suggested for uh, the, what we used to call, we're still calling circuit breaker will be introduced, which meant a, a temporary short time um, break of the social network to break the transmission and give, uh, um, give the NHS uh, some breathing space. Great. So this Great. wasn't particularly followed and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that led to uh, obviously increased mortality and all, of, and all of that, and then to, to a longer um, uh, lockdown uh, that followed. So- Thank you. Thank you, question, Angela. I, I think that's- that's a very, very good introduction for us to, to and, and we can I, build on this, I think, in discussion. I mean, you've set out very clearly yeah. the very intense... I just, I just have a question. Let me finish with this it, it, 30 more seconds. Um, so I, I, I do fully appreciate that there are not just health considerations to be taken, and, and I'm very well aware of the social and economic costs or mm -hmm. any intervention. So my question is, but why uh, there was there was this missteps in a way? There is an interesting BBC podcast that goes through all of this. By the way, uh, was it because of social and economic consideration, or it was simply indecision? What well, there was a political will that didn't particularly allow uh, a, an effective exchange between policy science. Great. Well, thank you, Daniela, for that excellent introduction to, to your work and how you approach that through SPY-M. And then the question you're left with, particularly reflecting on those two very, very significant instances where you felt the science wasn't followed. And yeah. I think we may come in discussion to how then you, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an expert inputting to the process, then rethink about your role and, and how you present and communicate the evidence and, and how you how you see your role now is it different to how, how you saw it at the beginning but let's come to that in discussion and uh, now turn to Parth Patel who as I introduced um, has been an A&E doctor in, in the context of COVID but is now principally working as a research fellow at a think tank looking at some of these questions so over to you Parth. Thanks Rob. Um... So following the science, I'm going to focus very much on those first two words, following the lead, um, and not, not, not touch on the science just now, but maybe we can come back to what science means in the questions. So following the, that, that describes the process really between science and policy and that messy route that science takes through the politics, through the political economy to end up in policy. It broadly relates to two questions or two, two topics. First is how scientists see themselves and their roles in the policy making process. And second, how decision makers and policy makers 
interpret and use the science mm. to again and sh shake out some policy. Let's start with that first one. How do scientists see themselves and their roles in this? If you're a scientist advising the government, you're very much involved in the policy making process. Um, I think that's true whether you think that or not. Um, so I think a good example here is the, um, the interview that Chris Whitty gave to Fiona Godley uh, at the BMJ at the end of October. He said, when he sees a problem um, in his capacity as the chief medical officer, he looks at it and works out if he thinks it's a technical problem or a political problem, and then decides whether he can engage with it. Um, well, that's quite a false dichotomy to set up um, and not true of what his role actually is. For example, political, as if a political decision couldn't be technical, the lifting of lockdowns, or as if a technical decision couldn't be political, do we or do we not prioritize prisoners for vaccinations? Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is not that Chris Whitty doesn't engage in the policy making process, he certainly does, but whether he consciously appreciates he's engaged, he's involved in that. And that depends on how you see the science. Is the science it's so, uh, a descriptive science to you, or is it something that has normative value? And if you uh, work in public health, particularly in public health in a pandemic advising government, well, science is certainly normative, it's not descriptive. Um, it's not just on that end of the spectrum at which scientists don't consciously always engage in that policy process. You can see on the other side too, scientists that demand things of the government, not the ones that sit on stage, but the ones that perhaps sit outside of it. Um, do not open schools, for example, hands down, do not do it. Again, that's on the other end of the spectrum, but it has a similar roots in a lack of proper engagement with the political process, with the, with the decisions that elected representatives make. And again, that determines to what extent those decision makers will follow the science. So moving on to those decision makers, those policy makers, um, and how they interpret science to then make a decision to make a policy. Evidence isn't neutral. Um, evidence presented to decision makers, to policy makers, has to be interpreted. And it's interpreted through a couple of lenses. So there's a value lens or an ideological lens, and then there's a political lens. And the way evidence will travel through those lenses can lead to wildly different policy. Um, again, I'll give an example. Let's let's take evidence that was quite early on in the pandemic. People from all minority ethnic backgrounds were more likely to die from COVID-19. That was pretty unignorable pretty early on in the pandemic. How does that then shake out and translate into policy action? Well, on one hand, let's take um, let's take a sort of a lens about individual responsibility, the role of the individual, and what's happening here. The reason that people from minority ethnic backgrounds are more likely to die from COVID is because of an information gap. What I need to do as a policymaker is to fill that information gap so people have the freedom to act responsibly. So what I might then suggest is translating materials. I might think about personalized risk assessments. I might think about celebrity campaigns to encourage people to get vaccinated. All of those things increase information for the individual to then act responsibly. We've seen quite a lot of that. Now, if I looked at that same evidence, people from all minority ethnic backgrounds are more likely to die from COVID and used maybe a different lens to interpret that evidence, maybe something that, so maybe something structural is happening here. The reason that everyone from non-white backgrounds is more likely to die, well, maybe there's, it's to do with the differences, structural differences in the conditions in which people work, the conditions in which people li live. That leads to quite a different set of policy options. You might think about community isolation facilities. You might think about increasing sick pay. You might think about prioritizing vaccinations. The point really here is that the same evidence can lead to very different policy. And perhaps a good politician would probably use multiple lenses. There's no right or wrong here. You need both of those lenses I described and you need many more. And being able to take account of all of those things um, is perhaps the mark of um, a good decision maker. So what does that mean now moving forwards, moving sort of out of the pandemic and looking ahead and the role of science and politics and policy? Well, there's likely to be quite a big overhang um, of how science interacts with policymaking and politics now. That's very interesting. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we see a more technocratic form of politics going ahead, but it does mean there's a lot of potential there for scientists to interact more with politics and policymaking. Realizing that potential, 
will depend very much on how scientists engage with that messiness of policymaking. Um, and I think um, Claire may come on to describe some of that. Great, thank you very much, Parth. I mean, that really sets out some of the tensions and complexities of this relationship, which you know I think have been exposed for, for, for everyone to see. So it's great now to be able to turn to Claire Craig, who to some extent has made a career out of, of thinking about these relationships and trying to help science and, and policy come together productively. So Claire, um, bringing your experience to, to, to this question, how, how have you seen the relationship unfold during the, the current year and, and what lessons do you think we can learn from, from what we've observed? Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob. And uh, it's good to be here. Uh, so um, I think the main uh, lesson uh, is that we're clearer both how um, essential knowing what the best science is, uh, how essential it is to know that, and also um, its limitations, and uh, that it's not uh, a kind of an either or, uh, that both of these things are true. Um, you can't blindly assume that the science is going to tell everything, tell you everything that you need to know in order to act. And just because it doesn't do that, it can't be ignored. Uh, but what I actually want to do, I thought might help um, uh, for this discussion, uh, was to um, say a little bit about how we got to the kind of mechanisms and cultures, um, the behaviours, if you like, that we've that we've uh, that we've got in science advice, um, and, and kind of therefore what uh, the experience that we're now going through is, is, is likely to lead to. Um, and, and really going back, um, the government chief scientific advisor role uh, actually came out of the experience of the Second World War um, and uh, science advice in the Ministry of Defence. And the UK was probably the first country, the first major country to have a formal uh, general government chief scientific advisor. Um, and um, SAGE, um, uh, in turn, uh, may be taken for granted now, but um, in fact, it was only formalised around 10 years ago. Um, what had happened before that was it became clear that um, governments had a tendency to, to rely on advice uh, from their own uh, scientists and their own agencies and departments. And that simply wasn't good enough because the really good science is generally happening in universities and you have to be able to access it. And there were ad hoc arrangements. So Dave King brought in external modelers for the foot and mouth epidemic a while back that really changed what government thought it should do and, and, and helped. But uh, John Bennington, uh, who was government chief scientific, scientific advisor for a while, uh, formalised SAGE, and and also getting science into the National Risk Register, which you, you hear about from time to time. Sure, and like in its 10 years or so, so SAGE has dealt with things like floods and um, the volcano that stopped uh, uh, air, fly air flight for a while, um, and um, uh, uh, earthquakes. Um, there are two learnings from that that in turn sort of shape what I think we're seeing. Um, the first is, uh, as uh, Path said, the science never completely determines the outcome. The kind of classic example of that in a very specific position would be the uh, Japanese uh, earthquake and tsunami of um, 2011 that led to the nuclear emergency at Fukushima. And SAGE was stood up to advise COBRA on whether um, British citizens should be advised to evacuate from Tokyo, whether it was more risky for them to stay or to go. And SAGE basically said uh, that the risks of evacuating were greater than the plausible worst case scenario um, of staying, um, largely because if you travel long haul flights, you get uh, uh, exposure to radiation um, uh, just from that. Um, but other, uh, so, and, and, and the Prime Minister at the time in COBRA uh, looked at that assessment of risk and, and didn't advise evacuation. Uh, other countries with, you know, we must assume, same access to, to evidence and the same sort of advice, took a different view on the risks, on the perception of the risks and on the politics. The second key learning um, I, I, I suggest came first with the Ebola outbreak um, of 2014. So SAGE then was advising the UK government on uh, interventions uh, in the UK and also in particularly in West Africa. And the epidemiological advice was, um, was sound on its own terms, but it, it wasn't working. Um, it wasn't working as well as it should. Um, and SAGE for the first time had to have a subgroup of anthropologists and historians and others um, because it needed different types of knowledge to get 
um, the right sort of um, mix of disciplines um, into um, the decision making. And uh, the anthropologists and historians said you need to look at funeral practices, you need to enable people to um, uh, maintain social values while also um, being able to tackle the epidemic and that worked better. And, and, and both of those things I think um, we, we're seeing played out um, in different ways in, in COVID. Um, in particular, um, on, on terms of science not giving, um, sort of determining the outcomes, we maybe need to become more um, uh, used to or comfortable with acting with provisional Produce certainty, um, get off the hook of events. having to um, feel somehow that science has to be held to a standard of absolute uh, certainty or assurance um, and, and, and work with what you've actually got and, and the advice that brings. Um, the, on the point about multiple disciplines, um, it, it, it's also been interesting to see um, uh, Patrick Valance uh, in September, I think it was, called on the British Academy, so the uh, history, the um, arts and humanities um, uh, um, uh, leadership uh, body, uh, and asked them for advice, as well as all the good stuff that we've been hearing around, hearing from from Daniela and, and Path, um, and the behavioural sciences that David will no doubt talk about. And so we had historians and um, ethicists and and all sorts of different social sciences actually also bringing advice. And and they're looking at things like, and they've made recommendations on uh, things to do with digital, with urban spaces, and indeed, in fact, with uh, local science advisory networks, and maybe thinking about how we can build not only recovery faster, as we have to make uh, evidence-based or evidence-informed decisions for the recovery, but also, and my kind of historical line maybe points to this, also thinking about how we can learn from what we're learning, from what we're seeing with COVID, that will better prepare us for the next civil emergency, which may be an the pandemic or maybe something else entirely. Great, thank you, Claire. And, and that brings us nicely to, to David Halpin. So David, you know, you've been working hard to bring behavioral science in to help inform decision making. And in fact, you have been involved in, in SAGE discussions. So it, it would be great to hear your perspective on, on the topics we've been discussing. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, my fellow panelists. I'm really interesting to be part of it. I just in my few m minutes of, of collector remarks, good to get on the questions. Some great questions coming through. Um, is kind of just a quick framing comments. Then zoom in a bit on the science. And actually, one of the things I'm saying is actually scientists themselves are humans, prone to error too. Um, and then just a glimpse forward about what are some of the lessons, sort of structurally, about what you might do this. So, I mean, if I had to choose two areas, what I think is particularly useful. In fact, I would take thank you for my many years ago when I was a natural scientist and um, doing experimental science, one of the things I got to do, a wonderful Natsky program, is I did history and philosophy of science, which I think is actually incredibly relevant to some of these current discussions, which is to understand actually the real character of science um, and um, how it moves forward. And, and to put alongside that, actually, the behavioral, we wrote a report a couple of years ago in the behavioral insights team behavioral government, which was instead of the normal work which we were doing, which is how to get people to pay their taxes or whatever, or take their medicine, but actually to look also at policymakers as humans and the kind of errors which we're prone to make. And if you put those two things together, history and philosophy of science, and then some of the behavioral science applied back on policymakers, it's actually, it overlaps quite substantially. Um, I won't go through the, the whole thing. Um, Danielle sort of sped it up, but there's a sort of clear phasing to what's happened over the last 14 odd months. Um, in broad terms, so you kind of had an early, certainly very science-led period, I would say. Um, and Claire will know very well, um, if she compares the experience of previous chief scientists, I mean, I've been around the central government on and off for probably nearly 25 years. Patrick Vallance has extraordinary power and access and being in to see the PM on a regularity, which would have been pretty much unprecedented, sadly reflecting the times. So in that sense, it's pretty dominant, a great boon for science, that kind of profile is there. Um, we then have a, a, you know, a second phase, which is much more where, in some ways, there's a, a rebalancing, there's a kind of secretariat which is built in the centre, the political becomes much more prominent, I think, for the second phase, to some extent appropriately, and there's a third phase sort of towards late 2020, um, where there's a kind of more balanced, I think, environment um, with different kind of considerations coming together, and of course we get the vaccines all coming in as well. So I'm going to focus particularly on the early phase, where science actually was given extraordinary profile, I think, in relation to policymaking. Um, and, yeah, I mean, really, it was incredibly compressed, those sage discussions, and then Chris and Patrick running out straight into COBRA meetings and briefing the PM. 
I mean, it could not be more hot off the presses, you know, what Spy M and Spy B and others were saying and what was their judgment and then it taken in. In fact, if anything, that created a lot of pressures in that the normal integration that would happen in these processes, which is it would come to COBRA, right? Um, which Claire meant, mentioned, of, which is the idea is that's, you've got your chief scientist and chief medical officer, then they're kind of brought together by your cabinet secretary who says, well, what's the treasury view and what's the other considerations and bring them together. But it was so fast, as we all know, you know, literally the numbers moving and the science moving potentially quite fast as well. But one of the lessons I think I would say is there's a lot of discussion, of course, around, and there will be for some period about whether there were political missteps or this or that, the other. But I think one of the things in this discussion, and particularly Rob, given your interest in science and policy, is to say, well, where were there also scientific mistakes and missteps? Now, science is about that, right? I mean, I can think of a very prominent scientist who um, very engagingly sometimes gives his talk to say basically everything he's ever published has been shown to be wrong, right? And in some ways that's to be celebrated as a scientific method that it has this kind of falsificationism built into it and will get revised and changed over time. But that's quite an unfamiliar one with the policy world where you're particularly looking, you know, to, to Chris and Patrick and others to say, what's the answer? Even the word sage, it conjures the notion of Delphi-like advice coming down from on the mountain, doesn't it? Um, but there's some of those missteps are just to be expected, right? As the knowledge comes in, we should revise it. A good, let me give some concrete examples. So some of the transmission mechanisms from, and they were very expert people, still are, you know, like Jonathan Van Tam, literally wrote the book on flu or whatever, had pretty clear early steers on the transmission mechanism. If you think, remember it was about to what extent is it ballistic versus fomite on surfaces versus aerosol based. A lot of the early views was that it was very much ballistic primarily, particles spat or whatever, and then to some extent fomite. And the aerosol based stuff was underplayed early on. I think most people would now say from what we've learned over the period that actually needed to be re re revised and eventually was revised over time. So that's fine. We shouldn't, we shouldn't complain about science that the fact that it updates is a good thing. And in fact, in some ways, the more troubling examples to zoom in, in, in on, I think, are where it gets stuck because of strong priors. And that's where I think the overlap with kind of Kuhnian revolutions happen fast, you know, or Lakatosh is relevant. Because the UK was genuinely blessed to have around the table in SAGE, extraordinary expertise, right? We had these amazing modelers who've been studying this stuff going right back to the 1918-19 pandemics and so on. And this was built into the models and, had, you know, virologists and all the rest of it. But you also have to watch out the extent to which sometimes your prior knowledge might also be a trap. And I think an example of that was that we, we hadn't had the experience in the UK, of course, fortunately, of, of Mars and CERS, you know, an earlier sweep as South Korea and others had had. And a lot of the thinking you can argue was, was based on a world before that, you know, how it would, and then the very dominant idea about a wave, a wave that you couldn't stop. So I think I would say one of the strong assumptions, if you like, and it was more than an assumption, it was discussed, was the belief amongst many of the, that, that community, the modeling community, um, that essentially you couldn't stop a second wave, that South Korea and China were basically going to, even if you were suppressed, it was going to pop back up. And that was quite an important scientific prior, which then drove a lot of policy, which we can discuss, but probably wasn't right. South Korea has done an amazing job, as Taiwan and others have done, but it drove a lot of policy. The other priors to look out for is when they get in the way of finding a new, um, a new insight or lever. And again, a prominent example might be masks. So the UK and the scientific community, I think, was quite slow, and you might argue so also WHO, to get its head around masks. And to some extent, it's hard to understand, I think, on the basis of the evidence alone, it's almost territory for anthropologists to say, we somehow felt like it wasn't very British, or a behavioral assumption that the, the public wouldn't somehow wear masks, which as we know, of course, is, is not true. Um, so watch out for our priors, basically. Um, and then finally, let me just at least put down some hooks for discussion about what might some of those implications be. So I think one of them is you want to really try and get a balance um, of disciplines around the table. I think Patrick and others would all agree with that. Um, I, of course, will speak to behavioral science, you know, human beings. How do you figure that out? Will they comply? Will they wash their hands? How can you maximize that? Will they isolate when you ask them to? Will they take the vaccine or will they be nervous about it? These turn out all to be behavioral. Equally, there are loads of questions which turn out not to be as it were, scientific questions, but are closer to engineering. So the contrast sometimes made in other languages more clearly than English between knowledge, the facts, versus know-how, 
about how to do something. And again, a lot of the models, for example, as you look at Daniel, I can talk to it more than me, but they just, they have numbers inside them that presume that 0.75% of people will comply X, Y, Z. Well, that depends on how easy it is or how difficult it is. If you like the engineering of solution, which isn't incidental to what you do, but it's absolutely fundamental when you bring it together in policy terms. So finally, um, what are the ones you might try and do? Well, so bring in those different kinds of ranges, including delivery issues, being very explicit about uncertainty. And one of the interesting evolutions through SAGE is it started to really express levels of uncertainty when it made recommendations or claims, a very good development. Another thing in policy, just red team, overtly say, can someone have a go at ripping this apart in terms of the policy? A very good practice, I think. And of course, I must make a play for, well, we've got to think about um, the human aspects of it, which I think has been really driven home in terms of first, second, third line of defense against the pandemic tend to be riven through with behavioral questions. And it's a legitimate issue to say, well, look at the extraordinary depth of research we often can turn to in relation to the biomedical, and then say, is it really matched in terms of the other, if you like, social or soft sciences? And is that good enough? I mean, the answer is probably no. Great, thank you, David. So we've had some brilliant questions already. So you do go to Slido and, and keep adding your questions. But um, I think also the discussion itself has, has, has raised many more questions. Daniela, I wonder if I could turn to you first. I mean, really almost to respond to, to what your fellow panelists have said. But we've had one very you know, clear, crisp question posed to us, which is, would it not have been better sometimes uh, to give res more responsibility to scientists to actually take the decisions? H how would you answer that question, Daniela? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think, I think, um, I think there are lots of other considerations that I don't think scientists are in the position of, um, you know, I have the knowledge of. And, and if anything, uh, a conversation, a communication with, with, the, with, with the policy makers, that is essential. And a, a, clear, a, a clear communication, which accounts for uncertainty, David, accounts for all the things that we don't know enough about, uh, you know, not pretending that the numbers that we put in our models are right, uh, of which there's been an enormous, uh, an enormous discussion, and most of the discussion that happens is happening still now in SPIM is about uncertainty and how many things we don't know about. So I, no, I, I think it's a, it, 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 it has to be a joint, a joint activity. Uh, I can. Uh, I can provide my, I, I as a scientist, but lots of others like me can provide the evidence. We can discuss on the, on the, on the type of evidence and on the limitation of the evidence. And then the policymaker can bring their own consideration, their own question, which might question the evidence, but also might question whatever, whatever objective or whatever goal they're trying to, to, to achieve and maximize. I, the policy or the strategy is not always very clear to the scientist. So we are not in a situation where we could, uh, we should be taking the, the decision, but perhaps be brought in into the thinking or the making of the strategy. I think that is, is something which is important. Yeah, um, I, in, I, I would have lots of, uh, lots of comments on, uh, on, um, on David's point, I mean, one of one of the most obvious one is is the example of the South Korea and uh, and uh, and uh, and the prior beliefs. And I don't think those are prior beliefs. Those are were coming out of uh, of, of the science that we and the evidence that we were creating, unfortunately. And South Korea, I mean, it's it's a, it's a very particular example that. Uh, is a nation is a nation that has uh, has been dealing with SARS, has been dealing with MERS, uh, and has accrued an enormous ability and, and experience to actually think and act in in an emergency of that of, of that time. So I think the comparison is not quite uh, uh, as uh, as it looks. <laughs>
Anyway, I could go on forever. So thank you very well, well. <laughs> I wonder, you know, you, you've picked this up as well, Daniela, the importance of, of uncertainty and how that's communicated and understood through the process of, if you like, dialogue between the advisor and the decision maker. And David, you raised this too. I mean, I wonder from the point of view of a behavioral scientist, do you think that we have, are, are we learning about how to uh, present and communicate uncertainty through these processes? Is, are, there, are there grounds for, for hope there, David? Um, I think so. I mean, one of the roles you may know, well, I know you know, is I serve as national advisor on what works, which is to kind of create institutions which do this. And one of the, for a number of areas like education policy and so on. Um, and one of the things, if you look at the output from their work, is they very commonly, Education Foundation would be a good example. It has an estimate of the effects size for a given intervention, but it also has an estimate of how much it costs. And importantly, how confident it is in that judgment. Yeah. So that's a very, that's something scientists are more used to that, but um, it's really important to express your level of uncertainty. And SAGE actually has become much sharper in the last year, I think, of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, there's another question I think I saw earlier, which I just, just touched on in the chat, which I thought was a great one about passing the kind of science from, you know, the government having to follow it to making the public do it. But it does bear, I think, on your question, which is ideally, again, open you know, as a question rather than a statement, but you don't, you won't, you won't just be in the business of being, when you're asking the public to do something, if you like soft authoritarian, you must do this, this is the rigid rule. What you're ideally trying to do is communicate something about the actual etiological you know, vector, basically. So a famous example, much discussed, has been in Japan and the three Cs. They didn't go for a distance. They didn't go for one or two meters. They tried to explain to the public their best understanding of what the disease vector is. And the great advantage of that, assuming you got the science right, is it is enabling people to make some context-based judgments about how they should also adjust their own behavior. I'm not saying it should be all of it, but it has a major advantage for people understanding what the disease vector is, be you a parent or a carer, versus you're just following the rule because that's the rule. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's, it's clear that this question has, has got a lot of supporters out there. So this this interesting, it has the responsibility for following the science been passed from the government to the public? And isn't this unfair? Well, David, you've picked that up um, very well. But Parth, I don't know if you have a comment on that for, from what you've seen. Yeah, it's, I, think, I think it's a good question. And I think the answer um, is both yes and no. Um, um, again, I think whether how you see this or sort of this shift of responsibility from uh, the government towards individuals comes back to the point I was making about how ideo ideology and values shape how you interpret the science. So on one hand, again, if you see if you see this, if you see responses to COVID acting responsibly is about individuals, it's about giving people the information to act freely and act responsibly. That's quite different to seeing it as the government's responsibility to give people the capability to act responsibly. That's quite different. Um, it's about how you see individual agency and how people then respond to that. And again, there's no right and wrong. I think what this question cuts to is that question, is that debate, that ongoing debate about in personal responsibility versus collective responsibility. Um, and it's quite a polarized debate in that people often fall on one side of it. Um, now, the, the reason people fall on one side is, is because it's it's very ideological. It's about your value set. And I think, again, a skilled politician would probably consider both ends of those of those questions. There's no right or wrong between individual and collective responsibility. They're not a binary. And indeed, you need both um, to get through a pand pandemic, as South Korea may have. I mean, I think if I, if I hear you correctly, Path, you, you're advocating that there's sometimes more, more explicit discussion of the value judgments that are sort of in, inherent in scientific advice. Um, and what, what does that lead you to think about a public inquiry? So we've had one question come up is, is should we have a public inquiry now? And I guess that's one about timing, but I guess I'd be interested in your reaction to that, but also what do you think we should hope a public inquiry will 
make clearer or, or, or what should we hope from a public inquiry? So my, my opinion is that yes, there should be a public inquiry without getting into the timings of it. The reason for that is quite simple. It's that the part and parcel of being a politician being elected is that you're accountable. There has to be a degree of transparency into the decisions you've made and what's driven those decisions, which again connects back to that earlier question about whether scientists should have made more decisions. And I think very much the answer to that is no. Um, scientists are in general quite technocratic. They see things as right and wrong, whereas politicians are more value driven. They see things as left and right. Um, so yes, the answer should be that there should be a public inquiry to, as a form, as a system of democracy. Um, it's the system of democracy, the form of government we have, and an inquiry helps produce that degree of transparency, and I think is likely to be valuable. Um, not going to get into the question about timings unless we really do want to delve into when the right time is for that. Okay, well, do when is for path? Is it now? In uh, one uh, word? Yes, probably. <laughs> so that's two words. We'll accept those two words. Um, Claire, turning to you, we've had quite a number of questions around science communication. Um, one interesting one is, you know, ha had had the UK lost knowledge? So ha had we lost our science communication knowledge from other pandemics, such as in the question of puts it polio in the 1950s? Um, a related question is, do we feel that um, our, our sort of institutions for communicating science will have learned and improved during the course of the year? And perhaps a, a third related question is, can you look around the world and see where science communication communication has been done well. So there are three kinds of questions, Claire. You know, I don't know if you want to take any or all of those questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, in terms of, of kind of lost knowledge, um, I mean, yes, uh, I, I think I think the loss is, is not necessarily specifically about science communication so much as um, how the communication lands. And uh, certainly there was some thinking um, in the context of, say, the concerns about the MMR vaccine and um, and, and, and uh, so-called links with autism. But as it were, the further away you got from knowing what an epidemic looked like, the different judgments you might as an individual make about the balance of risks between doing something to prevent something you, that you'd never experienced um, and, 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 and not doing it. So in other words, um, there are things probably that land, that will land differently in the future. Decisions will be made differently and science will be heard differently because we have now experienced this type of disease and that some of the actions in other countries will have been different. Some of the political decisions will have been different, some of the behaviours will have been different because they have had more recent experience of things that are somewhat similar. Um, so I think that, that's, that's true. Um, on, I just wanted also to cover the sort of science communication more generally. I mean, you don't have to be amateur about it, is one of the things. And I mean, Cambridge itself now has the, um, the Winton Centre for the um, Public Understanding of, of Risk. Uh, you know, th there are things we've learned, and one of them is that under many circumstances, expressing uncertainty doesn't, as some people seem to think, stop people trusting the scientist. It actually increases the uh, the layperson's confidence in what the scientist is saying. So if you say, um, you know, I think that uh, such and such may happen between the bounds of this number and that number, actually, um, and, and a lot of this uh, evidence comes from studies of climate change communication, but actually people are more comfortable with you saying that than you saying, well, I think the number is X, just because they know the number can't possibly be X. It, it, you know, you can't possibly know that. It may be X, you know, a little bit more, or a little bit less. But so um, there are things that that we uh, that we have learned and that we now can learn more of um, about how to communicate science in ways that then help people to engage with it and then make decisions either themselves or um, as as um, decision makers. Um, and then, because I just in case you don't have time to come back to it, I also wanted to pick up the question on uh, why there are so few women in um, a number of the advisory and decision making processes. And Dian Daniela may have other thoughts, but one aspect is um, that science advice is basically not valued by um, the science community. So you get you get uh, Nobel prizes, you get um, promoted, you get research funding for publishing new knowledge. 
Um, and an awful lot of advice is about coming together with people to, pre to, to get existing knowledge into decision making, and it's really undervalued. That tends to mean it's the kind of thing that people do, frankly, in those extra hours, and um, at least um, for in many cases that's slightly easier uh, for men to do than for women, uh, even among scientists. Um, Claire, can I follow up on that on that question? I mean, I guess I'm assuming you think it is important to have diversity of, of people, not just sort of disciplines involved in the advisory process. Do, do you believe that's the case? Um, well, David was expressing, I think, think it very well in terms of the kind of red teaming and uh, so diversity of ways of thinking, absolutely. Um, and um, kind of that then leads you to think about all sorts of other dimensions of diversity. Um, I, I, I don't think that all women think differently from all men and therefore, uh, you know, it's that, that kind of balance at all, but difference in ways of thinking, difference in experience as well, which might cause you to ask slightly different red teaming type questions. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that certainly would be, would help to improve the, the robustness of what comes out. Great, thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of build towards sort of a final round of, of comments, um, but um, do um, please panel, you know, raise your hand if you want to react to what you've just heard or want to respond to a question um, in, in real time. But what I, what I might do in the sort of final round is is we've, the, the, the last question that's just been posted here is about learning. So learning from COVID-19 response, and the question puts it, what is the ideal structure for contributing scientific expertise in the future? So you could answer that question, or you could answer my version of that question, which is, what incremental improvement would you most like to see? Um, um, da Daniela, do, do you want, shall we go in the, the sort of the order of the, the people spoken? So you spoke very eloquently about your role in SPY-M, what you were called on to do. And I know you've worked incredibly hard, you know, over the last 14 months. And you also talked then about your kind of unease, really. You expressed it where you saw the advice pointing in one way, and then you didn't see the the decision making, you know, uh, follow that in, in, in March and September. That must have been quite difficult for you personally. I mean, maybe you could sort of talk about, you know, what it actually felt like for you and then how you think drawing on that, you know, what the incremental change or the ideal system you'd like to see. It's difficult to, to, to suggest a system. Uh, maybe at the end of all of this, we'll have a better uh, idea and definitely will be lots of learning from, from this experience. Remember that this is the, the first pandemic that of our times. I, I think I think the H1N1 in 2009 was a, 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 such a mild uh, pandemic that it didn't really stretch uh, the system at all that this one has. Um, what was my reaction? I was, um, I was perplexed and I was very anxious. Um, and uh, I mean, particularly, particularly at the beginning of the year where you know, our, our efforts were enormous to, uh, to, to put together, make sense of the really scanty evidence to try to understand where, where we were going with it. And, uh, and you know, this, the 2nd of March for us was already, was already there was evidence that the NHS was not, was not going to be able to, to cope with anything. And not even with the mild, uh, with the mild sort of restriction uh, that the, the, the were being considered. So something needed to be done quick. And, and, and the frustration was very high because we, we just couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't convince uh, anyone to, to, to act quickly enough. And then in the week, the starting, the thing, the, the, the 16th, the 15th, and then things were, in fact, the 13th, which was, I think it was the end of uh, Thursday or Friday, I don't remember. But uh, um, we finally, you know, gave the, the final evidence they actually moved to the old system. The frustration and the, and the, and the um, preoccupation or what we were going to, to see, given that perhaps decision should have been made a bit earlier. Uh, that that was very vivid. I remember that very vividly. And then in September, the same. Yeah. The same. And so I guess I mean you you talked about the 
the, the value of having more space for dialogue between yeah. the scientists giving advice and the people kind of processing that and the people making decisions. So, you know, there could be more mutual understanding built up during the process. I, I, I think that after this, after this experience, um, people have learned an awful lot. I think, uh, I think the experience of um, communicating and, uh, and, and the limitation of the communications, I think will be, uh, uh, will, I mean, understanding the limitation will be very useful. I think from now on, uh, things will, will be different. And in fact, it's interesting, positive balances came to spy a couple of times to thank everyone for the work. And uh, and and appraising and really praising the the the, the work that we've been doing and, and giving the idea that perhaps this kind of uh, process uh, will be considered in other uh, in other emergency of, of other types, which is not I mean not necessarily health emergency. Mm -hmm. So they are actually thinking of of setting up structures of this type. Uh, around which we've learned an awful lot in this uh, in this situation to to guide and to assist and support the evidence you know the, the, the provision of evidence for other action in the future i mean we, we mentioned here different other threats of uh, you know volcanoes or earthquakes or, or, or so other civil emergencies yeah. And I mean, that's going to be so interesting, isn't it? And so important in terms of what investments we make in the institutional capacity to yes. respond quickly to unexpected or Absolutely. You know, un uncertain even if, uh, events. Path, I don't know, could you pick up this question about what ideal system or what, what incremental improvement you would like to see? Yeah, if, if, if you pushed me to pick one incremental movement, it would probably be the transparency in decision making and government decision making. There's there's transparency in terms of what scientists advise, but how does that then that messy process between that scientific advice and the decision that's made? That's still very very unclear. Um, and again, this is a value judgment. I prefer a technocratic form of politics. So obviously, I'm going to say something like this. But I think that would be an incremental movement. Um, I would like to see those structures and processes that take scientific advice into decisions that then affect society and people um, in expressing that. I mean, we've just had a new question come in, Path, and I, I don't know if you've seen any evidence for this, but but is in a way a, a political question about what oh, what the sort of standing of experts is going to be at the end of this whole process. You know, an, an earlier question said, you know, are are scientists going to be used as a scapegoat? And of course, you know, difficult decisions have been made or not made in the name of science. Um, or or will, will the wider public kind of appreciate the, the importance of the role of experts? Do, do you have a sense of, of that part? So there's been some early polling on this and it's just polling, um, but that faith in experts looks like it's been gaining. Um, it looks like the public want to hear from scientific authority um, that's not to say that scientists may be may not be made scapegoats by politicians. That attempt may well happen, but I think I think it, yeah, I think there's very 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 possible. I would question if faith in experts was ever lost by the public. And again, I would say that may well be an example of political gaming. But I think the public do like to hear from authority, and particularly they like to hear from medical authorities um, who they trust. So I think that's something um, to bear in mind as we move out of this pandemic. And, and, and perhaps certain scepticism of experts has always been there and is also perhaps health healthy for democracy as well. But no, well, let's leave that <laughs> leave that for another day. Um, Claire, any your final sort of thoughts uh, pointing to sort of steps you would like to see? Um, so, I mean, I think that uh, the relationship between the kind of international and national and local politics um, uh, is is going to we're going to it has sort of been highlighted and and we're likely to think afresh um about local decision making in all sorts of different ways so i rather like the british academy's uh suggestion that there should also we should also think about science advice at the 
example, and how um, universities and cities, for example, can work together. Um, and we've got to remember that in thinking about the lessons of from this pandemic, we mustn't. We we must be ready for the next thing to be different. Um, so it's it's about building systems that can cope with an unexpected thing, um, uh, rather than as it were the next COVID but better. Anyhow, so local, I think, would be really good to to pursue. That's that's a really yeah important point. And as you say, you know that could build up resilience to respond to all number of different challenges if we have that kind of dialogue or interconnection working more effectively. So, David, do you have the final word? Well, let me just make one main point then. I feel like the enduring lesson, which the pandemic has driven home, but frankly should have been there already, which is the biggest win is not just the knowledge, it's the incorporation of the scientific method into policy. So some of the great success over the last year is the not the things which we knew before, but the things that which we didn't, which were then figured out. That's what is extraordinary. Which drugs were run in very rapid trials to figure out actually this gave you a marginal improvement, sometimes quite substantial, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the challenges is you really want to, particularly a place like Cambridge, when you teach students, it's not that they will use that very particular knowledge. The most valuable thing they're generally taking with them is a method, right? Is to be able to figure out what you don't know and how you'd find the answer. And if we could incorporate that into policy, that would be a very, very big deal. So even within pandemic, we had conversations, for example, about um, communication of science. Well, actually uh, being an art, why can't that be a science? So we've run trials, quite extensive trials, to work out what was the best way of explaining to people that they might want to wash their hands more often. Or a good current one is how do we get across the idea of um, meeting outside is much safer than inside or duration issues. I mean, it doesn't have to just be an art. You can run it literally. You can run trials of thousands of people. But within the test and trace system, to try and figure out what's your hypothesis? Where do you think the virus is? What's the most effective way to get someone to comply? Actually, that's what you want to do. The biggest win of all is to incorporate the scientific method into policy. And if we get that, I mean, that is a huge win. That would be an amazing thing to achieve. Well, thank you. It's great always, even when we've been talking about such, such serious matters and, and some grave failings, it's really good and uplifting to end on, on some notes of hope and optimism. So, um, on behalf of everybody watching, a huge thank you to David Halpin, Claire Craig, Parth Patel, and Daniela DeAngelis. You've all been really terrific in sharing your thoughts and experience. And thank you all for watching and the, the really uh, fantastic questions that you've all posed. Oh,